Let's turn our attention now to God's Word. We will be in Acts chapter 11, and we'll be in the final verses of this chapter, Acts 11, verses 19 through 30. title of this message is The Christian Mission in Antioch, in Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 30. In our text today, which are the, the final 12 verses of the 11th chapter of Acts, we'll see the growth of the church at Antioch that takes place through the preaching of the gospel to the Gentiles, and that it was here that the followers of Christ were first called Christians. And so before we get into our text this morning, we'll open with a lesson on pride uh, as an introduction. First, a funny story I saw. It's a preacher who found a shoebox in a closet, in his closet. And he opened it, and he found strange contents. Inside there was an egg carton, and it was filled with, not filled, it had five eggs in the carton. But next to the eggs, there was a stack of money that totaled about $10,000. And he was very confused about this, and as soon as his wife walked through the door, he stopped her and asked if she knew anything about this, this odd combination that he had just stumbled upon. And the preacher's wife says, Yes, dear. After we got married, I decided that every sermon you preached, if it was a bad one, I'd put an egg in this shoebox. And so the preacher became very prideful, thinking about all the years that they had been married, and there were only five eggs in the box. And he says, but honey, what about the $10,000? And she says, oh, well, every time I got a dozen eggs, I sold them. (laughs) Pride is the only disease known to man that makes everyone sick except for the one who has it. We've seen the gospel come to the Gentiles through the preaching of Cornelius, um, or through the visions of Cornelius and Peter. The main hindrance to this, the main hindrance to the gospel coming to the Gentiles prior to this was the pride of the Jews in believing that salvation through faith in Christ was only for them. Pride puffs up and causes one to think more highly of himself than he ought. Just as the Jews took pride in their bloodline, there was a danger of Gentile converts being filled with pride as well. Romans uh, chapter 11, verses 17 through 24, uh, Paul writes this. He says, and, and he's writing of, that, of the, the olive tree that is representative of, of God's people. And he says, but if some of the branches were, were broken off, and you, being a wild olive, were grafted in, among them and became partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree. Do not be arrogant toward the branches. See, this was a danger that the Gentiles would face. Now that they're being grafted in to true Israel, to the true olive tree, uh, th- there was a danger of them becoming arrogant toward the branches. But Paul continues if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right. They were broken off for their unbelief. But you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, He will not spare you either. 
Behold then the kindness and the severity of God. To those who fell, severity, but to you, God's kindness, if you continue in His kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? In Christ, there is no room for boasting or thinking highly of oneself. Gentiles were, and and really still are, tempted to think that there is something inherently lovable about them that makes them superior to the Jews if, if God was willing to cut some Jews off and graft them in. Unbelieving Jews, the natural branches, indeed were cut off because they refused to believe in Jesus. Paul wrote about this also, and he says, For they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel, nor are they all children because they are Abraham's descendants. So, just as those who were who were Jews that were confident in the flesh, were cut off, which means they were not truly believers to begin with. Um, they, were, they, they claimed, as Paul said, not all were Israel who are descended from Israel. They claimed to be, they were, they were is, Jewish descendants, but yet because of their unbelief, they proved that they were not of spiritual Israel. Um, there's the same danger of being cut off to those who claim to be born again and who do not continue in bearing fruit in keeping with repentance. Meaning, again, this cutting off is not someone who had salvation and then lost it. It was those who claimed to have, but yet by their fruits and by their unbelief proved that they didn't. Many who hold to a good work, whether it be a prayer that they said one time, or or being baptized, or attending church, or being born into a Christian family. Um, in other words, the, the, the confidence is in the flesh, just as the confidence of the Jews was in the flesh because of their circumcision um, and their bloodlines. Uh, many who hold to this uh, many hold to these things as their assurance. And sure, they would say, if you were to ask, that they were saved by grace through faith. The words are there. But when you look at their lives or you hear their testimony, you'll notice many times that in their testimony, there's no grace there. No, no mention of of sin, no mention of repentance, no mention of receiving saving faith. Only, you only hear of, of works. Well, I know I'm a Christian because I said this prayer. Well, I know I'm a Christian because I was baptized. I, I know I'm a Christian because I was born into this family. Or uh, you know, my dad's a great Bible teacher and he taught me I have, I have relatives who, would, who, who say these things. But they would say, saved by grace through faith, but yet, by their actions and their words, that you can see that they're only holding to works. And many times they're too blind to see it. All of this boils down, boils down to one thing, really. And that's pride. Pride in self. Pride in what I did, or pride in our um, heritage. And what we must be reminded of 
whether Jew or Gentile, uh, is that there is no hereditary salvation. No one is born again into the family of God because of the way that they were raised, because of their parents' faith, because of anything else. All must repent. And so the New Testament makes this all very clear that if we are in Christ, those who were far off have been brought near. If a, so that's us Gentiles. And those who were near, you know, those who are Jews by birth, they're only saved in the same way. By grace, through faith, in Christ. All must repent. No room for boasting. No room for pride in the family of God. And so now, let's look to our text and let's see how this mission to the Gentiles and how the Gospel transformed them. And we'll see this in a... Uh, these points of our uh, using this as an outline, the, we'll see the believer's mission in Antioch. And then we'll see Barnabas' mission in Antioch. And then we'll see Barnabas and Saul's mission in Antioch. And then in the last paragraph, we'll see the prophecy of Agabus. And then we'll see this great transformation of Christian love and humility. And so, let's read our text this morning. And we'll see how the Gospel transformed these men and women in Antioch. Acts chapter 11, beginning at verse 19. So then those who were scattered because of the persecution that occurred in connection with Stephen made their way to Phoenicia and Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except to Jews alone. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, preaching the Lord Jesus, and the hand of the Lord was with them. And a large number who believed turned to the Lord. The news about them reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas off to Antioch. Then when he arrived and witnessed the grace of God, he rejoiced and began to encourage them with to encourage them all with resolute heart to remain true to the Lord. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. And he left for Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for an entire year they met with the church and taught considerable numbers, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Now at this time some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up and began to indicate that the Spirit, by the Spirit that there would certainly be a great famine all over the world. And this took place in the reign of Claudius. And in the proportion that any of the disciples had means, each of them determined to send a contribution for the relief of the brethren living in Judea. And this they did, sending it in charge of, of Barnabas and Saul to the elders. And this is... God's Word. Amen. So we'll begin with the believer's mission. Their mission in Antioch. And we see in verse 19 that Luke connects this event to the execution of Stephen in Acts chapter 7 and the great persecution that arose in its aftermath, which was now about a decade prior. Uh, all of the Christians, other than the apostles, uh, left Jerusalem. We see this in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, that we see that Saul 
was in hearty agreement with putting Stephen to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So over time, the Christian ministry had continued um, into these regions uh, in, that, that we've just uh, read about, Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch. So here we are uh, in Jerusalem, and then Paul, we, we, we saw him uh, when he came back to Jerusalem go from Caesarea up to Tarsus, and now the, then the gospel is spreading in, in Damascus and Syria, and over here is, uh, this region here is Phoenicia, this island that's about a hundred or so miles off the coast is Cyprus. And then you can see way over there uh, to the left, to the west, is uh, Cyrene in northern Africa. And so the gospel um, uh, in, the, the, in the Christian ministry had continued to these regions. Uh, of, but for the most part, as we read, the gospel, the good news, was, o- was only being shared with other Jews that were living in those regions. But we see in verses 20 and 21 that there were some of them, uh, some of the dispersed Christians, the Hellenistic uh, Greek-speaking Christians, uh, men of the nearby island of Cyprus and the North African region of Cyrene. So, these men from here in Cyprus and Cyrene are over here, um, and they're proclaiming the gospel. They decide that they were going to share the gospel with the Gentiles as well. So these regions that they're from had thriving Jewish communities, but on the, of their own accord, they began evangelizing the Gentiles in Antioch as well. Antioch became the capital of the Roman uh, province of Syria. And Antioch had a population of more than about uh, more than half a million people, making it about the, the third largest city in all of the Roman Empire, and, uh, which number one would have been Rome, number two would have been Alexandria. And so this is a very populated city and, and, and very much in darkness. So it's estimated that, that less than 10%, maybe even f- only 5%, were even Jews. Uh, in Antioch. And so there was a great population of pagans. And so some of these men began evangelizing the Gentiles there. Uh, these men, and, and, and they, they, were, they were likely not aware that they were doing anything radical. They simply preached Jesus to everyone they could and not realizing the the revolutionary greatness of this act. And Scripture tells us that the hand of the Lord was with them. So they're preaching the gospel. They've been converted. And now they're preaching the gospel to, to Gentiles. And the hand of the Lord was with them. And a great number believed. And so one thing to note here is that, that it is Christ who builds His church. It wasn't the zeal of these men. It wasn't the, um, the revolutionary nature of bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. It was only, it, the mission only succeeded because Christ was with them. If the Lord's hand were not with them, if the power of the Spirit is not working in conjunction with the Word, then none would have believed. It's the Word and the Spirit. These are the, this is the ordinary means that, that God uses to bring sinners to repentance is the Spirit working through the preaching of the Word, the proclamation of the Gospel. And so this was their, the, the, the believer's mission. These guys from Cyprus and Cyrene, their, their mission in Antioch. But now we see Barnabas' mission, his mission in Antioch. So when the church back at Jerusalem 
had gotten wind of the mass conversion of Gentiles in Antioch, they sent Barnabas to validate the mission, just as they had previously had been done when Peter and John went to Samaria to validate the mission in Samaria. And that was Acts 8.14. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John. And so here, they hear that the Gentiles in Antioch had received the word of God, so they send Barnabas. And presumably, one of the reasons that Barnabas was sent was because he was also a man from Cyprus, where some of these evangelists were from. Now, Joseph, a Levite of Cyprian birth, who was also called Barnabas by the apostles, which translated means son of encouragement. And so he, 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 they likely send Barnabas because he would have had some more of an ability to relate with the evangelists who were there proclaiming the gospel than, um, than one of the other apostles would. And so there's a, a point in there is that you know, we all have an area of um, influence where we're going to be most effective. You know, and so if we find out that, you know, well, there's this great revival and many people coming to know Christ with these evangelists that had come from uh, Brazil. What's going to be more helpful to the church to send me who doesn't speak a word of Portuguese or maybe uh, Emerson or John there? Not John Fisher. He doesn't speak Portuguese either, I don't think. But, <laughs> um, you know, or, or if there's you know, this, this mass revival that's going on in the Haitian community to send me who does not speak French or Creole or to send Andre um, who does. You know, and so we see this. It was you know, so they were sending it not just to say go check it out, but to go minister, be of assistance, help. There's a revival going on here. There, there, there's a great awakening of those who have been blind that are seeing the light of Christ. And so Barnabas goes, and and Luke uses four verbs to apply that that apply to Barnabas. We see that first he arrived. And then he witnessed the grace of God. He saw the grace of God. And then he rejoiced. He rejoiced at, at this uh, salvation that was taking place among the Gentiles. This is probably another reason they sent Barnabas. Because Barnabas had always been an encourager. We saw that his name, he was the son. They named him Barnabas because it means the son of encouragement. And you remember when Paul came to Jerusalem and none of the disciples would accept him. They, they, they were scared of him, but Barnabas took him by the hand. And he said, and so Barnabas was a bridge builder. And so, they, so Barnabas goes and he, he rejoices. He sees the salvation. He doesn't care what their ethnicity is. He just sees people coming to faith in Christ. And he rejoices at that. And then he begins to encourage them uh, with Resolute heart. This, so this pattern, this is a pattern that we see, that we'll see in Acts with Barnabas and, and Saul and, uh, or Paul in Acts 13 43. Okay. I don't have it, it's not on the screen, but in Acts 13, 43, it says this, When the meeting of the synagogue had broken up, many of the Jews and, the, of, and of the God-fearing proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them were urging them to continue in the grace of God. And then in Acts 14, verse 22, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And so here's Barnabas here already encouraging them, remain true to the Lord. 
you know, many pre- will preach a gospel today that pre- that, that, that's only a gospel of, um, n- that, well, that's not a gospel of warning of the persecution and tribulation that will come if you repent and turn to Christ in faith. This wasn't the case in the first century. They would, they would all, probably almost immediately upon repentance and faith in Christ begin to be persecuted and going through tribulations. If everything was going to be uh, just a bed of roses once we come to Christ, well, they wouldn't have needed encouragement to remain true to the Lord. Why do we need encouragement to remain true to the Lord if everything is always going to go well for Christians? No, we need the encouragement to remain true, to remain steadfast, because we will face hard times, we will face persecutions, we will face tribulations and turmoil and tumult in this life. And we need the encouragement to remain true, to remain steadfast. As we just read in Acts 14, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. So how does one continue in the grace of God and continue in the faith through persecution? There is only one way. There's only one way that, that, that you can hold tightly to Christ. There's only one way that you can remain true. There's only one way that we can continue in the faith and continue in the grace of God, and that is only through clinging to the Word of God. It's only through being encouraged by His Word. Does it encourage us, if we're going through tribulations, to go and open up God's Word and see all that Paul went through? See his his stonings and his whippings and his scourgings and his uh, being uh, arrested? And to see him face these things and remain steadfast and faithful to the Lord through it. You know, we saw in Revelation earlier earlier this morning that Jesus described himself as the faithful and true witness. The one who who's faced persecution and uh, to the death but remained faithful and steadfast. And so we have this encouragement that we can go to God's Word and be encouraged by the faith of those who went before us, those who laid the foundation of Christianity and, did, and, and, and remained true to the, to the Lord. You know, and to know that, that persecution and difficult times in this life is not a freak thing. It's not out of the ordinary. It is very ordinary. It, was, it is very normal. And that we're called to remain true through this. We saw that in all of the, in the letters to the churches in Revelation, remaining steadfast and true. And this is remaining steadfast and true through trials, tribulations, and persecutions. So Barnabas goes and he's encouraging them. Remain true. Continue. Be steadfast. We also see here in verse 24 some other reasons why Barnabas was likely chosen to go to Antioch, representing the church at Jerusalem. One, we see he was a good man. He was a good man. He was a man of impeccable character. He was a man that remained faithful to the Lord, as we'll see, but he was a man that that did not, was likely one that had self-control, didn't lose his temper. He loved the brethren. Even if he was offended by someone, he loved them. He was a good man, a man of impeccable character. And we see, secondly, that he was a man full of the Holy Spirit. It was the Spirit of God working through Barnabas that enabled him to be an encourager and a bridge builder. In other words, his life exhibited the fruits of the Spirit. His life exhibited 
these were the characteristics of his life that, that, that um, would define him. Love. Joy. So when it says he was full of the Holy Spirit, that doesn't mean what many take it to mean uh, today. Where well, full, because you know you'll ask people will ask you, well, is your church spirit filled? And you know what they mean by that is, do you speak in tongues? Does your church speak in tongues? Are they uh, healing people? You know, in your church, or you have you know, that, That's what they mean by you know, is your church spirit filled? But what the Bible means when it says that that Saul or that Barnabas was filled with the Spirit, full of the Spirit, is that he was full of the fruits of the Spirit. He was full and overflowing with love. With joy, we saw this joy when he said that when when he went to Antioch and he saw the conversion of the Gentiles and he rejoiced and he encouraged them. He was full of peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self control. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit. And he was also full of faith. He was full of faith. His his faith, which was a gift from God, produced in him spiritual desire, expectation, and dependence on God. We can be sure that when, when Saul went to Antioch, he didn't go there thinking, Okay, I'm going to go and I'm going to find all of these people who are just pretending. They 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 don't you know, they don't really believe. No nobody ever believes the gospel anymore, and so I'm sure that these are just fakes. No, he was full of faith and ex- he was full of expectation. He believed that when he got a report that the spirit of God was working and he was in, in converting Gentiles, he was expectant and encouraged and rejoiced. He was a good man, full of the Spirit, full of faith. Oh, that that we all as Christians would strive to be this kind of Christian. Full of faith. Full of the Spirit. Overflowing in love, not judgment. Overflowing in in self-control, not anger. Overflowing in, in patience. In kindness, in gentleness. You know, you can rebuke a brother or sister that's in sin, and you can do it lovingly. It doesn't have to be, even though that sin may anger us, but we can rebuke gently. Oh, may we be full of the Spirit, full of faithfulness. So Barnabas, he goes there and he sees that many are being converted. Many have been converted and and, and, uh, considerable numbers were brought to the Lord. Many were repenting and believing on Jesus and Barnabas being the humble man of good character and full of the Spirit that he was. He he knew his limitations. And so now we see Barnabas and Saul's mission in Antioch. He knew his limitations and so he left for Tarsus to look for Saul. It's been roughly eight or so years since Acts chapter 9, verses 26 to 30. It says, when, when Paul came to Jerusalem, he was trying to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took a hold of him and brought him to the apostles and described to them how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had talked to him, and how at Damascus he had spoken out boldly in the name of Jesus, and he was with them. 
moving about free. Paul was moving about freely in Jerusalem, speaking out boldly in the name of the Lord, and was talking and arguing with the Hellenistic Jews, but they were attempting to put him to death. But when the brethren learned of it, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus. It's been about seven or eight years since uh, this interaction of, of, of Saul and Barnabas. And Saul went to Antioch. Uh, Barnabas knew where he was. And so he says, I want to go find Saul. There's great work to be done here. And so I'm going to go find him and bring him to Antioch. Now, it was likely, most scholars believe, that it was during these years, these eight or so years, that Paul had been in Tarsus, not associating so much with the apostles anymore. They're in Jerusalem. They're ministering in other areas. That it was during this time that most of the uh, sufferings and the persecutions that Paul Face, that he writes about in 2 Corinthians 11, that, that, that many uh, of those sufferings took place during these eight years. Um, although there were more to come, but many of them took place then at this time in, in, in the silent years of Saul's ministry. Barnabas recognized that Saul was gifted and called to preach both to Jews and to Gentiles. And so he went off to find him. And when he found him in Tarsus, he, he brought him back to Antioch where they, they ministered together for an entire year. They met with the church and taught considerable numbers. Their ministry, notice, was teaching. They met with the church and when they met, they taught. Their ministry was not planning programs and events to entertain the masses. Their ministry was not figuring out how to make church more relevant today and more modern in order to draw in the crowds. They taught the Word of God and they preached the Gospel. This is what the disciples in Antioch were doing. This is what Barnabas was doing. This is what Saul and Barnabas was doing. And this is what the Lord used to bless the church, to add the numbers to the church. The Spirit works through the preaching of the Word. This is the calling of every church, whether they realize it or not. Teach the saints and make disciples. Not to entertain the saints, not to appease the saints, not to create recreation for the saints, but teach the saints. If it's not God's Word that's the draw, if it's programs and activities, then if you lose the programs and activities, you lose the people. Somebody said to me one time, you'll, you'll gain them with a hamburger and lose them with a hot dog. You know, it, it's just the church, the church's focus must be on preach the Word, teach the Word, teach the saints. That is what is relevant to the church today. That is what God works through. Do we want God... Do we want our numbers added to because we've come up with great programs? Or do we want it because the teaching of the Word? And God works through that. Sometimes that growth can be slow. Sometimes it can be faster. We don't know. That's all in the Lord's hands. But this is the calling of every church. Teach the saints. Be faithful to God's Word. And we see here, that the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Now, it's unlikely that the disciples came up with this name on their own. Uh, they had other names that they called themselves, as such as disciples, or believers, or brethren, or slaves of Jesus Christ. 
This term that was assigned to them in Antioch was not likely meant to be a compliment, but was actually meant to be a derogatory term that was assigned to them by unbelievers. It literally means would mean Christ ones. And so when those who have rejected Christ see those who are following Christ, then they give them this name, these, that's that Christ one. Well, what a compliment that really was. Is the scene in that day would have been that the Jews would have been wanting to, to separate themselves now from the Christians, to, to, to be distinct, um, to distance themselves from this group, because they were, they were considered to be a sect of Judaism. And so now they're wanting to create this distinction that these are not Jews, they're, these are Christians. They had begun to separate themselves from, the, the Christians had begun to separate themselves from the synagogue congregation and, inqu- and acquire an identity of their own. So although intended to be derogatory, the name could not have been more appropriate. It meant follower of Jesus Christ, a name that we all ought to strive to be worthy of, to be worthy of the name of Christian, to be worthy of the name uh, follower of Christ. Do our lives reflect that as they did with Barnabas? And so this chapter ends now. We see the church here um, that had been growing. And now at this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. These Christians, these new Christians, these Gentile believers were about to be given the chance for their faith to be justified by their works. One of these that came was uh, named Agabus. And he predicted that there would be a severe drought throughout the world. In other words, the Roman Empire. Uh, So again, the word world in the Bible does not always mean, and, and actually rarely means, the entire world. But here it means the Roman Empire. And indeed, there were food uh, crises in in Egypt and Greece and Syria and Judea during the reign of Claudius. These uh, Claudius reigned from forty one to fifty four A.D. and these uh, uh, famines took place around forty five to forty seven A.D., which would have been right about the very next year after this. Uh, uh, after this took place, this prophecy of Agabus, and so the. Uh, We're going to see here, lastly, Christian love and humility. So this prophecy that there was going to be a great famine uh, throughout the Roman Empire, when the believers in Antioch were made aware of this and knew that their brethren in Judea were in need, they were determined to help in whatever way they could. And so they, they, they considered them brethren. Although you have these you know, new Gentile believers, and most of the believers in Jerusalem are Jews. They were determined, though, to help in any way they could. They behaved as Christians ought to behave, in love and generosity. They wanted to support their fellow believers who were, who were uh, hurting or going to be hurting and be in need. This was real Christianity, real transformation. Some of these believers in Jerusalem or in Judea may not have been looking at the conversion of these Gentiles with rejoicing and, uh, as Barnabas and Saul were. But they also would have known that with the arrival of uh, Barnabas to them in Antioch, that there were some of their brethren there, if not all of them, but a lot of them were rejoicing. And so these new believers are humbled by this. 
that they're, that they loved them enough to send Barnabas to them, and now these that sent Barnabas to them are, are hurting or in need, and so they want to do something about it. They want to help. This was their chance. They saw this as their chance to say, we love you too. We give glory to God that, that not only that we're in Christ now, but that you're in Christ and we're brothers and sisters together. There was no pride here with them. There was no danger of them thinking, well, you know, he's grafted us in. We're better than they are. You know, let them fend for themselves. But no, there's humble love. Recognizing that none of us are worthy of the grace of God. Recognizing none of us are worthy regardless of ethnicity, regardless of how bad of a sinner we were in our former life, or how moralistic we were before God saved us. Our supposed moralism does not make us worthy of the grace of God. We're all unworthy. And so they recognize this, and they respond with humble love. Each of the believers made their own decision to support the brethren who were in need and gave according to their ability. <clears throat> they were all free to give as they saw fit. They were all free to each determine what they would give. Some that were more well-off probably gave more. Some who were not as affluent gave less. But they all gave according to their ability as they determined for themselves how to give. And the gift was sent through the hands of Barnabas and Saul. They, they took it back and they delivered it to the elders, uh, implying that the elders were expected to oversee its distribution. True Christian love and humility. Helping those who had previously despised them. Because remember, back before the conversion of Cornelius, Peter was questioned, you went to a Gentile's house and ate with her? But now they're showing love toward those who previously would not and did not accept them. Those who were far off have been brought near. And we're one in Christ. We're one in Christ Jesus our Lord. Within the body of Christ, there's no hierarchy. There's no levels of um, superiority. That in Christ, when we, when we come to the foot of the cross, and we're saved and redeemed and washed clean by the shed blood of Christ, it took no, no less of His blood to wash the moralistic virtue virtuistic person clean than it did to wash the prostitute or the drug addict clean. It's a level playing field at the foot of the cross. In Christ, we're all one. We're all in need of His grace and washed clean only by His blood. They wore the name Christian well. story about Alexander the Great, the great conqueror, brave warrior. And he found out that there was a soldier in his army who was named after him. His name was Alexander. But this Alexander was a great coward. And so Alexander the Great finds him, searches him out, and asks him, Is your name Alexander? Yes, my name is Alexander. Were you named for me? Yes, I was named for you. Well, be brave or change your name.
If you're a Christian, wear the name well. It was given to the finest. So we've read about them this morning. Deserve it to the best of your ability because none of us deserve it or don't claim it. Don't claim the name of Christ and live a habitual life not exhibiting the fruits of the Spirit, not growing in the fruits of the Spirit. Where none of us are perfect in them, but we ought to all be growing in them. This is a promise that the Lord's given His people. He will conform us to His image. As we sang earlier this morning, the fire will not harm us. Tribulations and trials will not harm us, but they will remove our dross and refine the gold. That's what Christ is doing in us. Withstand through it. Wear the name of Christ well. Eusebius described the trial and persecution of Sanctus under the Roman emperor Marcus Aurelius. Sanctus had been tortured and They told him that they were going to kill him. But he braced himself. He he set himself so firmly against them that no matter what they said to him, he would only speak four words. I am a Christian. We're going to kill you. I am a Christian. Renounce Christ. I am a Christian. No matter what they said, that was his only response. I am a Christian. If you're a Christian, wear the name well. May we be like these early Christians in Antioch and like Sanctus. Sound and firm standing in doctrine. But as we learned this morning, it's not just doctrine. It's not enough. But in love. As we saw with the new Christians in Antioch. Sound and firm standing in doctrine and steadfast in love. They had both. They were sound in the faith and they were fervent in their love. In these closing verses, it's as if the Spirit of God just stops right here and says, I want you to know that Antioch was not just doctrinal. They were loving. May we be a church and a people that teaches doctrine and makes disciples. And may our love for one another. Affirm the faith that we claim to have. If we claim to be Christians, may we wear the name well. May Christ be pleased to confess our name before the Father. Let's pray. Father, we thank You, Lord. Lord, for Your patience in Your long-suffering with us. Lord, we can be like the rebellious children who get told the same thing over and over and over, but then continue to walk in disobedience. Lord, and many times that changes over time to where we, we, you by your Spirit are gracious and you open our eyes to that, Lord, and we can see that we really are walking in disobedience. And, and Lord, for a time, for a time, we, we continue and that struggle is 
very real within us, the flesh against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And Lord, and then the attitudes and the ways that we lived in the past that didn't bother us begin to bother us. And Lord, we begin to be convicted of it. And Lord, and we're struggling within ourselves to say, I don't want to behave this way. I don't want to have this attitude. I don't want to have that impatience, but yet we still do. But yet we're convicted. Lord, and as Paul said, the very things that we do not want to do, those things we do. We thank You, Lord, that as he wrote, who can rescue me from the body, this body of death? And he says, I thank God in Christ Jesus. Father, work in us. Refine us. Remove the dross. Refine the gold. That God, that we will be able to look back and see where the Spirit in us, the Spirit that dwells in us is winning the battle over the flesh in different areas. But then more areas are exposed where we see that we fall so short. Father, we thank You for the circumstances, the situations, the trying times, Lord that You bring into our lives that reveal the... Well, we could easily just say it's a character flaw, but that's not completely right. That reveals the sin that still remains in us. Father, work in us through these things. Lord, let us see that when you bring things into our lives that cause us to respond with, with impatience, with harsh words, with loud talking, with harshness, Lord, that you're bringing those things in to reveal our sin to us so that we may repent. Father, let us never seek to change a situation without looking within ourselves and repenting and seeking our character to be changed and conformed to the image of Christ. Father, we thank You for this church. Father, we thank You for... Uh, all of us who are here, God, that we would be a body Lord, that is sound in doctrine, that teaches the Word. But Lord, and let us hold fast to that. But Lord, help us by Your Spirit to be a body who is steadfast and fervent in love for one another in kindness, in gentleness, in patience. Lord, let us be a people filled with joy, rejoicing when we see others turn to You through faith in Christ. Lord, help us to be a body that holds one another accountable. But, in love. Lord, in a way that brings about repentance, not resentment. Lord, form this local body and make us more like Christ. Lord, may we be the church that would be known not only for sound doctrine, but for our love for the brethren. Glorify Yourself in us. In Jesus' name. Amen.